Patricia Gibson, on behalf of the SNP. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to begin by thanking the Honourable Member for Central Ayrshire for bringing this important debate forward. And I think today we've all agreed that it's very important that when um, malpractice and failure in our NHS, which threatens the public interest, when members, concerned members of staff um, don't feel confident or have the reassurance that they should and could speak up to share those concerns, then our public services across the board are very much under threat. And this applies, of course, not just to the NHS, because we know that this has happened in other sectors. And the Honourable Member for Central Ayrshire, focusing on the NHS, pointed to examples in recent history which underline the need for protection of staff who raise concerns. Indeed, almost all official reports and the inquiries that follow have shown that co-workers had seen the dangers but had either been too afraid to raise the, la the alarm or had raised the alarm either with the wrong person in the wrong way. And of course, we only need to cast our minds back I'll just finish this point. We only need to cast our minds back to other examples like the Clapham Rail disaster, the Zeebrugge ferry disaster, and indeed the empire of Robert Maxwell. In every case, and in other cases, we know that people already had concerns but were either unable or felt un unwilling to come forward for whatever reason. Thank you very much. Uh, and on the point that just has been brought forward, I have met with numerous members uh, and, and staff of the NHS who have indicated to me their unwillingness to come forward because they believe that there is a, there is a culture of bullying within it. If they put forward a complaint, they will be the ones who will be targeted. Even, they, even though they want to remain totally anonymous, it does not seem to happen. Doctors in particular, I know one doctor in particular who ha raised an issue and it feels that he has been sidelined from promotion and everything else because of the stance that he took against his peers. Sadly, the point the Honourable Gentleman has made, we've heard it several times throughout this debate, um, sadly we're hearing it far too often and indeed the culture must change. And today, as we focus on the NHS, we all understand that that, of course, is a very important service to the public. If the public can't trust and have faith in the NHS, then we are in a sorry state indeed. And we need to be sure, and I'm sure that the Honourable Lady would tell us, that the reason why we need to make sure that there are robust mechanisms in place for whistleblowers to be protected is because ultimately it's about saving lives. Mr Chair, we will never know if safer whistleblowing with protection for those who raise concerns would have halted the activities of Ian Patterson um, in both the, the NHS and the private sector, given that concerns about his surgical procedures had apparently been circulating since 2003 and his, and his desires to carry out harmful and unnecessary mastectomies. As Professor Ian Kennedy, who reviewed Patterson's practice, put it, and I quote, whistleblowers do not fare well in the NHS. This is one of the major indictments of management in the NHS, that it is inwards looking, over defensive and prone to destroy by a variety of means those who suggest that the Emperor has no clothes. It is a blight on the NHS and it is one of the principal areas where lessons must be learned. So where further provisions to further protect whistleblowers are required, these should be put in place as the Honourable Member for Stirling has reminded us. It has been reported, Mr Chair, that up to 10 doctors, up to 10 doctors, who worked with, with Patterson are under investigation by the GMC, and it's believed that this is for failing to act on concerns. Now, I make no comment on that, but one does have to ask, how is it possible that there is even a culture where fellow medics could even be suspected of failing to act on such concerns? How on earth could such an ethos ever develop and apparently thrive? This is the monster that has lurked in the NHS, and this culture has to be changed, and it is changing, um, but it's not changing as quickly as we would like, as touched on by the Honourable Member for Hartlepool. As the Honourable Member for Central Ayrshire has outlined, in Scotland, the Scottish Government has implemented a number of measures to help protect whistleblowers and ensure they feel confident in speaking out. Extra legal protections are now in place for student doctors and other postgrad trainees who speak up 
if they are unfairly treated by their training body. But as the Honourable Lady from Central Asia has pointed out, these are quite separate and must be quite separate from standard employment issues. Importantly, the Scottish Government has committed to the function of the Independent National Whistleblowing Officer for NHS Scotland being held by the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, creating a mechanism for independent external review when an individual has a concern about the handling of their whistleblowing case. And this will be in place by the end of 2018. And the intention, importantly, is to ensure that whistleblowing cases are concluded in a reasonable timescale. We heard from the Honourable Member for Stirling about a case that dragged on for far too long over a long number of years, and that is simply not acceptable. The, the, as the Honourable Lady for, for, for Central Asia has pointed out, what we will what we're building in Scotland is a consistent approach. Staff will have access to an independent external body who can review their case and bring it to a clear, final and fair conclusion. And I urge the Minister today to look closely and carefully study the improvements made in Scotland to ensure that the system in England is as robust as it can be and as supportive to whistleblowers as possible who raise genuine concerns. Of course, that's not to suggest that Scotland has nothing left to learn. We all must continue to be very, very vigilant, as the Honourable Member for Stirling pointed out. We can appreciate how gagging clauses have been used in the past to suppress or potentially suppress information about patient care, which can lead to failings being repeated. And of course, I think we would all agree that that is completely unacceptable. And Quite timely in this debate, the Honourable Member for Central Ayrshire has reminded us, if we need reminding, about the tragedy of Mid-Staffordshire, which led to the deaths of as many as 1,200 patients. This must not be allowed to happen again. Such malpractice and failings can only thrive, can only thrive, in a culture where people are afraid to speak out and fear and secrecy reigns, as the Honourable Member for Hartlepool reminded us. We must learn from that. We have learned from that, but we must go on learning from that. And I urge the Minister to be ever vigilant and ever watchful. Of course, genuine concerns have to be raised in a responsible way, but they must be raised. And the NHS, as an institution, must encourage this, as both members for, for, for Stirling and Hartlepool have set out. A whistleblower cannot be seen as a problem, but as someone who genuinely is seeking to improve how things are done. And every member who has spoken today has alluded to that. This requires a culture change which will take time. And the culture change must take place in the many corridors and management offices of our health system. We are getting there, but we are not there yet and we can never be complacent. Openness and transparency are key for ongoing learning and improvements. And that culture is what will give our patients the confidence they need to have and should have. And I'm very keen to hear how the Minister responds today to these concerns.